Good afternoon, and welcome to the Facebook Live Milford Readers and Writers Festival, Doing It Right. I'm Edson Whitney, and I have the honor to be the co-chair of the festival, along with Carol McManus and the amazing group of talented and committed board and committee members who are bringing this event to you, the readers, for the fifth consecutive year. Despite the pandemic, we're excited that we can take the festival global this year with our virtual platform and bring the festival to you wherever you in the world you are. First, I'd like to thank Greater Pike Community Foundation and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts for their generous support. Now, for those of you who have not attended before, the festival is focused on the readers. Our tagline says it all, readers, writers, conversation. The readers come first, inspiring and engaging in conversation with the authors and each other. If you've been with us since Friday, we had wonderful conversations already with Gloria Steinem and Bob Eckstein and some of the New Yorker cartoonists. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Gordon Van Gelder returning to the festival for another year. Gordon is the former editor and current publisher of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and the editor of a number of books, including Welcome to the Greenhouse, New Science Fiction on Climate Change, very topical subject, obviously. He will be in conversation with Samuel R. Delaney, whom everyone calls Chip, author and literary critic who has been nominated for four Nebula Awards from the Science Fiction Writers of America and won two Hugo Awards from the World Science Fiction Convention. His notable science fiction novels include Babel 17, The Einstein Intersection, Nova, and Dahlgren. In addition to exploring the ways science fiction has anticipated the current pandemic experience, their conversation titled Science Fiction Today and the Milford Connection will highlight Milford's role in the history of science fiction, the famed Milford method, which originated here in Milford in the 1950s and in which they were both a part of in the early days. The conversation will la last for 45 minutes, followed by questions from you, our audience. You can post your questions in the comments and they will be posed by Lillian Longendorfer, also a board member of the festival. While all the events are free, your donations are welcome and are fully tax deductible via the donate link in the comments or on our website at milfordreadersandwriters.com. You, the viewers, can also hit the share button and tag your friends in the comments to share these amazing conversations while they're happening. So welcome again. Thank you all for joining us. Now sit back and enjoy the conversation and let's welcome Chip and Gordon to our virtual stage. Ah, great. Hi there, Gordon. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you, Chip? I'm hanging in. <laughs> I don't know about you. I'm happy to be in Milford virtually today. <laughs> yes, I had a lot of very good times there. I haven't been there for... Yeah many, many years in, in person, uh, but uh, I spent a fair amount of, fair amount of uh, Labor Day weekends oh, starting in um, 1966, I believe. Uh, an English science fiction writer recommended named John Brunner, uh, mm -hmm. I met in London while I was, while I was traveling around, um, uh, clued me into the, in, 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 uh, to the existence of science fiction conventions, which I'd never been to before, uh, and took me to some, um, oh, uh, took me to a Thursday night at some uh, pub where people uh, got together and then said, "Well, if you like that, you should go to, uh, uh, you should go to a science fiction convention." And then there's the Milford Science Fiction Writers Conference, uh, and I said, "Oh, well, that sounds like interesting." So um, I took a Greyhound bus down from New York to Milford the first time on mm -hmm. that day weekend for the for my first Milford Science Fiction Convention, which at that point had been going on for I don't know how many years. I think the first one was in 1956. Yeah, okay. So it was probably, probably been going on for 10, 10 or 11 years at that point. <laughs> I'd read about them in, of all places, mm -hmm. 
the magazine of fantasy and science fiction uh, when back when Ed Furman uh, was um, was editing. Uh, so um, so I was I was not I was not unaware that it did it existed, but I didn't know that um, you know I could just show up uh, with a with my with my guitar cases, which is what. <laughs> Uh, in place of a suitcase, and um, Kate, uh, the, the it was held at a place called the Anchorage, a wonderful old house in Milford. I think is doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I, I I know this actually. It it yeah. after Kate and da Kate and Wilhelm and Damon Knight sold it, they sold it to a fire marshal, I believe, someone who worked in the fire department. And Kate said, within a year, the place burned straight down to the ground. Uh -huh. Coincidence? <laughs> yeah, it, I li I actually lived there for about two mm -hmm. weeks when they left and went off to the West Coast uh. of Portland, and I lived there uh, with Tom Dish, Jane Salas, um, and um, and their little kid uh, at the time. Um, uh, Dylan. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and stayed there with for a while. And it was a great, great old house, mm -hmm. an organ in the living room, and a <laughs> big fireplace, and a balcony off, you know, running around. Which, when the first time I walked <laughs> the porch from the Greyhound bus, uh, it was filled with more science fiction writers than I had ever seen in one time in my life. <laughs> it was fun trying to, I, they were all people who... <laughs> And I knew, but the, the problem was to sort of identify them by what uh -huh. they were saying as they went around the circle. Crit critiquing, I believe the first story they were critiquing was one by Karen Anderson, Poole Anderson's wife. Uh -huh. uh, and everybody was, everybody wanted to speak, but the Milford method precludes you're actually talking until, you know, and, and okay. Karen was, saying <laughs> 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 something. <laughs> Anyway, that, so that, so that so the Milford method was what became the Clarion method. Where yeah, well, the, well, the Milford yeah. method. Very funny. The Milford method, of course, was based on what the people at Milford thought went on at the Breadloaf Writers Conference. Oh, okay. Uh, now, as far as I, and then that was taken over by 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 the Clarion. Uh, mm -hmm. by, by the Clarion Writers Conference, as far as I know, I am the yeah. only in the world who has been to all three. <laughs> I went to Breadloaf when I was about 18 uh, okay. before I published anything uh, and had a very nice uh, wor working as a waiter and then mm -hmm. um, and then be and take taking part you it was a, a work a work study scholarship for working is where right. you got the uh, entrance to all the workshops and what have you and the uh, workshops were not Anything like the Milford Nip <laughs> workshops, the um, one person held forth, and there was very little talk about anything, um, anything student written. Yeah. Well, I, I think we should probably back up a little just to get sure. the history of, of science fiction in Milford. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping you can fill in some of the blanks because I, I know, like I said, I know the first conference was in 1956. And I'm pretty sure it was organized by Jim Blish and Judy Merrill. That's correct. But yes. Both of whom I, I, had houses there. Uh, that's what I'm not clear on. Who moved in first and what? Who moved in first, I do not know. But okay. I do know that, um, as I said, uh, Damon's house was called the Anchorage. And it was right. a beautiful old place. Um, Jim himself lived about 10 minutes down the road so at, a, at a leisurely walk at a place called the Arrowhead. Um, right. which I always thought was named after Melville's house up at uh, yeah. up Massachusetts, but it turns out it wasn't. It was just because the land it was on kind of was shaped like an arrowhead. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then right across from the uh, uh, from the arrowhead, Judy had her little house, which was much smaller than either Damon's or uh, Jim's, uh, which I nicknamed the Potsherd. Uh, and so, and I thought of Milford as the place where there was the uh, anchorage, the arrowhead, and the pot chart. Uh, I think I slept at least once in all three, okay. and as I said, and, and spent several nights in the, in the anchorage when I within the two weeks I actually stayed there after the the, the, the Milford 
were over. And I think even once uh, uh, Virginia put me up uh, for a couple of nights. Virginia Kid. Virginia Kid put right. me up a couple of nights in the Arrowhead. So mm -hmm. I got to sort of see them all from the inside. Yep. <laughs> and it was very friendly. It was a small place, small town place. And it was very friendly, very friendly. I remember I having very <laughs> nice thoughts about Milford most of the time. <laughs> and so so uh, they cooked up the idea of holding this workshop, like you say, modeled on bread loaf. And I know they advertised it in at least one of the science fiction magazines. And Is they? It, yeah, so it, it, somebody just came across the ad in a 1956 issue of Imagination. It wasn't even one of the top magazines. It's mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the Hamling magazines. Oh. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> was it specifically published writers only? That was my understanding. Yes, it was. It was professional. It was professional writer. Right. If you be a, a professional science fiction writer, which of course is also very different from Breadloaf, because the Breadloaf yeah. people at Breadloaf they had um, professional writers leading the conference, uh, but everybody else was usually well, usually there were many. There were a few published writers at Breadloaf. Um, um, Oh, what is the guy's name? Uh, the tenants of Moon Bloom, and a guy, um, and and the pawnbroker, uh, Edward Lewis Wallet. He, uh -huh. I, I met him at Breadloaf, and he had just published his first novel, and to very good claim. And he was just a, sort of there as a as a student or a fellow, perhaps, and rather tragically died very shortly after going there. Mm. Uh, but uh, but there were and there were nice people and the waiters the waiters always had um, a sort of special cachet because most of the people who came out of the uh, bread loaf and went on and did anything had had been waiters. Yeah, uh, Truman Capote had been a waiter at the bread loaf and uh, the two guys who wrote the Ugly American had met as waiters at really? the oh, Burdick. Yeah. Wasn't Burdick, Eugene Burdick one of them? Yeah, Burdick and Letter. Yeah, had had met as waiters at the at the at the bread okay. uh, but a lot of there were a lot of other aspiring writers, no, but, but not too many of them did very much. Uh, but, my my my, I have a oh I why <laughs> now, but I have a my my roommate was a guy named Herbert Woodward Market Martin, and I have a little booklet of his poems. Mm -hmm. Um, that uh, he published, and and another waiter whose name was uh, uh, Frank Margotius also published some novels. Uh, uh, there, no, no, no waiter, no waiters at Milford. No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, from the early days, though, I guess the, the the workshops, the conferences were successful. In that people kept wanting to come back every year, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was useful. You, 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 you presented a story. The idea was you presented a story that mm -hmm. you thought had problems, and you uh. thought, "What would you do?" You know, this something. This is not working. Uh, if you could, if if your ego could stand it, <laughs> and you know, mm -hmm. and this, and what a lot of people ended up doing, of course, is bringing what they thought was their absolutely best work and trying to, you know, and to see uh, to see whether everybody. Right. Uh, so it was, a, it was a little very strange sort of thing. The, the town itself was just famous because so many science fiction writers had lived there or been through. Uh, there was another building in Milford down by the water, but an old hotel that went by the nickname of the homestead because so yeah. many science fiction writers had been there. And that one yeah. of the things one of the things I wanted to see when I was there, and people said, well, somebody says, well, I don't know if that thing is still standing. Maybe <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people were going there even then, but I did go see it. And it literally, the hotel was literally falling into the river. <laughs> the, the, the half of the ground floor was under water. Caved in? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And so we, I, I think, I don't remember who I was with or what, mm -hmm. but. Uh, um, against, you know, somebody saying, well, you don't even want to go into that building. It might collapse on you. I went in and walked around and thought, you know, and thought, gosh, Theodore Sturgeon slept here. <laughs> <laughs> and various and sundry, you know, I think Alfred Bester must have, you know, uh -huh. spent, oh, yeah, you know, uh -huh. everybody had come uh, at one point, you know, 
um, Harry Harrison. Uh, I think Harry Harrison, who would, yep. was there at my first Milford, pointed out where it was. And he, oh, okay. He, and this is before anybody had bought a house in uh -huh. Milford. Uh, and they just, everybody kind of liked it. And then the other people would come down and visit them and spend time with them. So it was very, very nostalgic walking around in this old, you know, falling to pieces hotel where right. there was not, it was one of those, these buildings where there was not a level surface or a right angle uh -huh. <laughs> in the entire building. I can remember the light and, and the no electricity work and going oh, okay. to these walls with the sun. The only thing it was sunlight from the rooms on the side with the door doors all, all gone. Uh, as I said, I was like, uh, it wasn't scary. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't ghostly at all. It was mm -hmm. just, it was just sort of like, you know, um, a, a sort of a remnant of a, of, a, of a once probably very nice and relatively inexpensive country hotel. <clears throat> now, one of the things I've started wondering from having followed this for years is how well the Milford science fiction writers got along with the townies in Milford. I don't know. I, I, I don't think I ever met. Did I, I don't think I ever met. Um, uh -huh. Um, a town, you know, a Milford townsperson, a townie. Uh, <laughs> as it, were. Uh, it was, I, I imagine they, it was, it developed something along the lines of, um, you know, of, of a college town or something, you know, uh -huh. where where a, a peace was, <laughs> a peace was, a truce was declared between the. Well, and well I, I, I actually, actually, you've answered, on. sort of answered one of my questions because I do know Harlan Ellison got into a fight at the diner. Uh, really? Jim Salas told me about this. Yes. I thought it was with truckers, but Jim said, no, it was just Harlan being Harlan, <laughs> not being willing to, willing to put up with whatever it was that set him off. The first time Jim told me about it, he said, Harlan, don't do that. They're going to beat the, the hell out of you. And Harlan <laughs> just couldn't let it go. Whatever it was, he got all worked up and picked a fight and they beat him up. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember once when I was driving down there, Mer Meryl, um, Meryl, what is Meryl's last name? If Judy's Judy had two daughter. daughters. Yeah, Judy had an older daughter, Meryl, and then a younger daughter. Um, well, Judy's um, Judy and Paul, Judy and Fred's daughter. Um, um, Emma, her granddaughter is Emily right, Paul. Emily. And right. I used to know her mother fairly well, but I can't remember uh -huh. her, her her mother's name. Uh, and uh, um, but uh, anyway, uh, I was driving down with Merrill, and we stopped in at some diner on the way to Milford to get coffee. And at that point, I had I as I still do fairly long and flyaway hair, mm -hmm. uh, and I was sitting at the the uh, uh, at a at a uh, at the counter, and we were having coffee and. English muffins or something, and one one guy kid came up behind me and said, "Hey, who does your hair?" <laughs> Obviously trying to pick a fight, and I said, "Oh, I yeah. do it myself." Oblivious, <laughs> and he didn't know what to say. <laughs> no, you know, and and Meryl said she was sure that it was going to turn into a, some kind of fight, <laughs> and I just, I just, I was, I was just, you know, oblivious to what was mm -hmm. going. So it didn't happen. It just turned around finally and walked away <laughs> because I I would not rise to his bed. She she later <laughs> was quite convinced that it was going to turn yeah. into something else. <laughs> yes, that was a sort of <clears throat> Harlan. I don't know whether that was the same kind of thing that happened with Harlan. I I, I don't know either. And I do know one of the other things Kate told me was back to the anchorage. You were talking about. I guess it was a big open space in the living room. Yes, with right. The fireplace. Yeah. Right, big and, fireplace and a and a balcony looking over it. And I just had an organ in one sort of big bay window at the far at far end. Kate said one day, while everyone was supposed to be writing or critiquing, Harlan got fixated on somehow swinging along, swinging himself up <laughs> the, along the balcony to the second floor by grasping the the balustrade and he spent half an hour 45 minutes trying and failing and falling down and finally achieving it 
And Kate said, without looking up, she just said, my son John can do that with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they had, I, I, I said, wait, it was John and Dusty. Those were there too. And I remember I, I ended up sleeping on a mattress on the floor in Dusty's uh, room. <laughs> I haven't met, met Dusty. I know John and the older brother from Kate's first marriage, uh, Richard. Mm -hmm. It did occur to me recently, I, I, I guess um, Judy was raising kids in Milford, Kate and Damon were raising kids, and uh, Virginia and Jim were, right? Right, yeah. I assume, I assume all the kids went to the local schools. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me, what would it be like to be the English teacher in that school and get a paper from get papers from some of these kids and look at it. And say, <laughs> you know, did your parents help you write this? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I have. To, I never. I never got any tales of that. That sort of thing. I do remember one of the things. I, I do remember that um, 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 when I was um, staying there by myself, um, there was a murder in Milford uh, mm. that. Um, that uh, some some kids had found some kids necking in a car and pushed it over a over a cliff. Oh, wow. wow! Yeah, and and I think I don't I don't know whether the kid the kid it wasn't a, I don't know whether murderers or a slow they thought it was a funny joke to push, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But uh, and when it's one of something that uh, I realized that you know that per capita, small towns are a lot more violent than big cities. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, New York has what one murder every, you know, three hundred <laughs> people. Right. You know? And if you know, and, and it's more like, you know, uh, you know, one one or two murders per year in a small town which doesn't have any. I don't. Yeah. I don't know what the population of Milford was. Yeah, I, I meant to look it up, see what it is now, and I forgot. I, I would expect it's under ten thousand. Sure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a small, very idealist love and really lovely town. <clears throat> and, and yeah. You might know something I've, I've wondered about for a long time. Kate Wilhelm told me years ago that one of her novels was set in a small town and Joanna Russ gave it a review and took it to task and said, this small town is cliched and unbelievable and, <laughs> it was, it was in an FNSF review, I've seen the column. Yeah, and Kate, Kate said she invited Joanna out to visit, and she yeah. said with, within a half an hour, Joanna looked around and apologized for the review and said, "Oh, you're, you're completely right." <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's 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 the way that that's the way I somebody that's the way I felt with uh, what was the name of the film um, Fargo. Uh, I uh, remember. Yes. The uh, Fargo, um, I, I when it when it first came out, I I was praising it, and I had just spent some time in um, uh -huh. in a small town outside of Minnesota, mm -hmm. you know, and I remember, and uh, my friend Don Levine, who taught film, kept on trying to say, but it looks it looks so cliche. I said, believe me, that's absolutely <laughs> what you'll find there. <laughs> right, you know. It can probably complete to the wood chipper getting rid of the body. <laughs> yeah, <you're> right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. We hope that's not a cliche. Right. Yes. <laughs> it seems to be the first thing that some people do think of when I've got a body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> what am I going to do? Wood chipper. <laughs> I know Bester had a scene in one of his mainstream novels of the woman who was collecting insurance on her dead husband. And I, I think he was in the coal bin. Mm -hmm. I, I remember it was, she said he's upstairs, but her unconsciously pointed downstairs and the investigator could tell from her hand that she tipped herself off and they found it, the body downstairs. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was in the rat race or who he. Rat race. Right. Yeah. Who, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, one of the things someone asked me about the Milford workshops that you can probably answer, was there a sense of them being a movement? Or was it just because you were around in, in what the start of the new wave in the '60s in London? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but, you know, when, yeah, I hadn't. I, yeah, I had. I had. I hadn't. I had visited Mike for an afternoon. Mike Moorcock, right? Mike Moorcock, and for an afternoon, um, and then at this, it's the second Milford 
Mike had um, uh, it was the one where Mike sort of in the middle of things got up and invited Jim to be to come to London. It was like it was the kind of thing Harlan might do at a, uh-huh. you know, at, a at a uh, at a Clarion where he used to every once in a while buy a story from a student to impress on them this what they were doing was serious stuff right right uh and mike sort of said you know you know we had read and he just invited he said jim i want i have to pick and in front of everybody i have to pick an associate editor uh uh-huh. and i think i want you uh-huh. so i think jim was all of 22 or so right. and jim was astonished so the next thing you know jim was on a plane to london yeah. where was, was associate editor for for a year, uh, right? And, and he, didn't didn't he buy um, Helix of semi precious stones from you there? Yes, he did. Mm-hmm. Yes, the, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, 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 that's if and Mike does. Mike never particularly liked my work. Uh, <laughs> he really did. I mean, um, yeah. Jim he told me get to fight for that one. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. and the only thing he ever ever said that he liked was Empire Star. He liked the politics. Uh-huh behind Empire Star, but he wanted stuff that was sort of a near, he, the, the new wave, if it had an aesthetic program, it was near future with political implications, you know, was what the, what was new about the new wave. Right. Uh, you know, and the political implications were not terribly far from, you know, basically mine or anybody <laughs> who thought of themselves as on the left, and I did. Uh, right, but there was, there was that manifesto that Mike wrote up which was basically saying, you know, we're out to undo what John Campbell has done to the field. Something you know? like, yeah, right, yes. exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Milford wasn't work, wasn't trying to do anything no, consciously no. the same way, no. was it? No, not at all. No, it was, oh, it, and that it was open and and very um, supportive of just about, you know, if you wanted to write a far future space opera, as long as you did it well, it was fine. And but, but most of the, most of the, most of the stories. Who went that went into went into Milford with the tuck were not the kind that would come to analog, even though uh-huh. you know some of the people like uh, Keith Laumer was yes. popular at, at Milford, uh, but uh, or Randall Garrett, and yeah, and although I, I now Randy I knew from before Milford, uh-huh. um, he happened to live in the same rooming house on 13th Street. Okay. For a couple of years, God, uh, and I met him there. I never knew him at Milf. I, I never uh-huh. knew he even went to Milf. Uh-huh. I, he did take me to a party once in the village, yes. where I met Judy Merrill for the first time, and she had no. Years later, when we met again, she had no memory of uh-huh. my being up with her on the subway uh, yeah. to take the to take the. What I'm sure she said was she was going to take the bus down to Milford that evening. Mm-hmm. Oh, for some reason, uh, but, but she said, and she said, I, well, I would never take the bus down to Milford. I took the train. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, she, there was one of these things where we both had slightly different uh, memories of it. But as I said, and she couldn't remember mm. having run into me at all. Uh, I only knew Randall Garrett was there because Ed M. Schwiller has some video, uh, some movies he took of Milford. Mm-hmm. And in one, of the, in one of them, you see Randy swimming in the uh, the Delaware Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, when Ed Emshwill was Carol and Ed were regular visitors at Milford. Right. Um, um, Ed Emshwiller filmed a very a, a film of his called Image, Flesh, and Voice. Uh-huh. At in Milford, one day I have a a tiny little, you know, yeah. mod for like one third of a second <laughs> in a kind of montage. Um, but there's a a long section with a voice with a voiceover by Tom Dish that's pretty the, the, between the images and the uh, and Tom's voiceover is very mm. strange. <laughs> yeah, uh, have you seen the the humorous piece that he made at Milford? Uh, I think it's called "It Came from the Back Issues" or "It Came from the Slush Pile." Uh, no. Oh, no. oh, I think it's on YouTube. You you definitely need to find it. Okay. You know, it's about three minutes long, and it's a comic piece about a monster that comes out of the back issues of the magazines and forces everybody to turn into zombie writers. And, <laughs> you know, it was all, you can see Carol and Damon pounding away at these keyboards. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, and Edward, Ed was an extraordinary filmmaker, and, and, yep. and he did he did do um, the first the first bit Milford I went to, we paw, one of the, the the nice things there there was a little a sort of mini showing of some of Ed's films, and I first saw Relativity, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of his early films. Well, they're not from that particular period. Uh, that has some very nice sections of it in in. Uh oh, oh, there you How are. We you dropped, good, you dropped out on me for a second there. Okay, well, I think our, our, our I think we're getting ready for um, um, for some some questions. Right. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. There was actually before we get to questions, I wanted to ask you one other thing. It sparked partly because I, I found this, which you may remember, James Blish novel, year twenty eighteen. Aha! Uh -huh. No, I never saw that. that oh, that okay. Really new, new to me. <laughs> well, well, it got me thinking. Here we are in twenty twenty. Of course, yes. we're we're all living in a science fiction novel nowadays. Uh, yes, <laughs> a rather strange one. <laughs> yeah, right, not the way I would have plotted it. Right. But the you know so much of science fiction's history was concentrated in Milford for a sm fairly short but incredibly creative intense period of right yes uh, you know let's call it 15 years and then everything kind of scattered from there right looking back at it now from 2020 how does it look to you do you have any perspective on it on milford well it was a, it was a, it, uh, i don't think uh, it, people people used to jokingly talk right after during the during the last years of Milford, people would talk about the Milford Mafia. Right. But, but, but boy, if there was ever a group that did not dominate yeah. science fiction, it was the Milford uh -huh. people. Um, they were they were just they were the absolute opposite of 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 a mafia. I mean, I think, um, um, which you know, um, and more power to them. As I said, they yeah. were extremely welcoming. Uh, uh, I once got into a strange um, letter altercation with um, Damon once that I mm -hmm. never understood. Um, um, in a letter thing, I said something about, you know, uh, his that his thing seemed to be uh, something that he was saying, you know, and I said it entirely in the sense of a compliment, and it and it was based on I think I told you about this 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 banner over the balcony yes. ex praising some Chinese right. marching youth group uh -huh. <laughs> you know, from mainland China, you know, uh, you know, and I said, uh, and so I said something about it. Well, you're uh, something about people who are on the left, meaning like me. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, you and see, see, you're even slandering me and calling me a leftist trying to <laughs> I, I thought you can't win. I said, yeah. You know, and I said, I said, I, 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 you know, I who always called myself a, a, a Marxist, you know, mm -hmm. left was a compliment. <laughs> uh, I, I was, right. I, I, um, and he felt that because I had mentioned it, I, I was slandering him uh, because this was a little too close to the McCarthy period, so that you yeah. know the the idea that somebody could okay. use a yeah. term like that in a praiseful way. Um, you know, um, that was the day. That was the time when there were conservatives, liberals, and radicals, and mm -hmm. liberals were the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. The liberals were really the bad guys. I was a radical. I was not, nobody's liberal. <laughs> you know, the liberals were people who wanted <coughs> the, people who wanted to make changes. The liberals who were something were people who, you know, who kind of would were more for integration than segregation. Uh -huh. but did, Make waves, right. yeah. You know? <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, now, that's aside from the the poster, uh, did Damon have other little um, pranks or things around the anchorage? I, I asked because someone, I think it was Kate, told me that you, you remember his story, um, not with a bang. Yeah, I remember the title. At any rate, I don't remember what it was about. That's the one where the last two people on Earth meet up in a restaurant. And the guy goes to the men's room and has some kind of seizure or something. 
and the woman has because of her upbringing would never think to go into the men's room you know that would just be is just verboten yeah and so uh as a gag damon put men's room on the bathroom <laughs> and the M. Schwillers were getting ready to drive back to Long Island from Milford. And one of the daughters, you know, went and came up to uh, Carol and said, and Carol said, well, you know, it's in, the, it's up on the second floor. And she goes right. running in, and come, come back out and they play this twice. I don't remember if it was Susan or, or Eve, but whichever daughter is obviously getting in distress. And finally, you know, Carol and Kate Walker over there and see that Damon's put men's room on, <laughs> on the bathroom. Yeah. And, you know, the poor Remshwilly girl won't go in there because of it. Right. There you go. That, that, that's, that, that's the 50s. So typical of Damon. 60s in, a, in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. But I, I thought that was pretty typical of Damon from what I knew. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, he was. The the other place that I remember in Milford was a there was a there was a restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was called the what it was, it was the Red. Um, was, it wasn't what was it the Red Rooster or the Red something? Um, and I'd asked somebody about it. Do, do you remember? Just I wish. Maybe, I, maybe. I don't. I, I know he, he took me out. He took me out uh, when no. I won the Hugo Award for uh, Time Considered as a Helix of semi-precious stones. Um, he had read the story and and he said it went, he said he had no idea what the story was about. <laughs> <laughs> He's, and he just, he just ended up, he and Kate had just done their two weeks at uh, the Clarion. Uh -huh. uh, they had been reading student story, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of student stories. Uh, right. Then at the end of this, I handed him time considered as a heel of semi-precious yes. And he uh, read it, and and I remember he he came. I knocked on the door, and we were going to. He, he said, "Chip, what is this story about?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, and so I thought. Well, I, I thought maybe it was going to end. I, he might buy it for Orbit. Uh, so I took it. Mm -hmm. I thought it's obviously not working for him. And then right. it, the Hugo uh, and a Nebula, both actually. Yeah. Uh, and for a, and uh, and on the day I happened to be down at Milford on the day that it, when the, the announcement of the Hugo came, so he took as a as a congratulatory dinner. He, he said, "Well, <laughs> maybe it was just wrong." To which uh -huh. I said, but "Not necessarily. Maybe you know, right? You go bad stories have won Hugo awards before. You know, I've always that, been, that reminded me. Did do you know if Larry Niven attend, attended a Milford?" I never I don't remember I don't remember okay. ever seeing Larry there. He may have attended one or no. two. Uh, I, I, yeah, Larry, just, I think I think Larry was on the West Coast. Right. Yeah, Larry was on the West Coast. So West Coast writers were not, you know, it was just it was a big it was a, a big expense to fly, right. you know, all the way across for a three day, you know, for a yeah. a, a, a weekend long conference. Right. Uh, so May have not may have been. I think he may have been there once, and uh -huh. I went there. I went like four. You know, I went to four Milfords at least. Mm -hmm. no, I asked about Larry specifically because I know Damon wrote somewhere that when in Constant Moon won the Hugo or the Nebula, I forget which. Damon said he hadn't liked the story before, but after it won the award, he went back and read it again, and he still didn't like the story. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why the Nebula Awards were established because um, too much of the, the a, a lot of people felt that too much of the Hugo Awards mm -hmm. were fan popularity. Right. You know, um, and one of the things that they, one of the things it, it um, you needed to be able to, if the, the, the story needed to be, have been read to, mm -hmm. for it to win a Hugo, if it had, didn't appear in a magazine yes. somewhere, you know, where right. you could, the magazine you, you could go get the story for 35 cents uh which is what the yes. maybe 50 uh you, yes. you know, it didn't have it it didn't have a chance uh we got we got a comment that the restaurant was called the red fox the red fox yes yeah there was one in yes. new york called the red rooster and the red, and uh -huh. it was the Fox and Milford, and I was always confusing the two of them actually which is why I hope I, not confused with the actor and comedian uh, no, 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 yeah. no, no. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, as I said, so I had a very, I had a, I, I think I had two dinners at the Red Fox on oh. two different years. Uh, and it was a very good restaurant, I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, So what are we? What? How? What? What sort of questions do we do? Are we at question time yet, or we're just about there? Um, <clears throat> I, I think Lillian's going to come in and to direct the questions to us. Oh, okay. All right. I'm just checking to see if I had had, had any other questions. Do you have any other big Milford memories that you, we haven't discussed? Yeah. Um, I, I remember the first, I, I think I told you that the, that first day, um, mm -hmm. was this big sort of thing with, with Karen Anderson's story. And one right. of the people there in the, one of the people in the circle was Joanna Russ. And, and as I said, it, Karen, it was clear that Karen, obviously something, I, I hadn't read the story. I came in in the middle of mm. the discussion. So I just, in my army jacket, I just pushed my guitar yeah. and sat quietly and listen but uh one of the uh it was clear that poor karen was about to burst and finally it got to joanna and i i never will forget this joanna said look she said this story turns on a poem by swinburne called the garden of persephone and if mm -hmm. you know the poem it makes sense and if you don't know the poem the story doesn't make sense and it's as simple as that and poor <laughs> And just re relaxed and sat back. <laughs> you know, somebody got yeah. what she was trying to do. Right. You know, uh, and um, I, I was I was very impressed both with Joanna, but more with Joanna, I think. Uh, and immediately went off and read the Garden of Persephone as soon as I could figure, so that I didn't miss any story. Yeah. <laughs> miss is that, any is story. that where you first met her? Yes. Well, no, it was the second time I met her. Okay. I had actually. We've met her before um, at uh, a dinner by the, thrown by Terry Carr, uh, and, uh, and I had been very impressed with her there too, because shortly after that I went and I met her, and she was great and a very smart young woman, yes. uh, and a couple of years older than that. And we eventually became very close friends I, right. by letter. It was a, an entirely an epistolary uh, uh, friendship, but. Um, the um, one of the things a couple of weeks later, I got her first novel in galleys, Picnic on Paradise, mm -hmm. and I yeah. read it and I was blown away by the novel. And I thought, and she didn't mention it all through dinner, <laughs> yeah. you know. And I thought Th that's class, yeah, if, right. where, you, where you don't work this work the work the conversation. Yes. And I have just finished this novel. That, well, right. this, Oh, with Terry, you know, uh, and uh, so and I read the novel. Plus, the novel was so in, in really incredibly good. Yeah, um, I, I I I always thought it was quite 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 something. I, I had one. I had the, the novel was published under the title uh, "Picnic on Paradise." I remember I when I I went yeah. in to return the galleys uh, to Terry and tell him how much, and I wrote a. You know, or, or endorsement for it. I said, I have only one suggestion. Why don't you call it Picnic in Paradise, which is, mm -hmm. the, you know, and he said, well, that's what Joanna called it. Uh, but we, <laughs> because nobody would know with science fiction if uh -huh. it was Picnic, you know, the world is called Paradise. And it's a, it's kind of an ironic title because the planet is anything but a paradise. Mm -hmm. It's right. almost more like a, like a hellhole. Uh, so that was, uh, and uh, I wish I when they when they republished it recently in the Library of America, I wish I had hoped they would change it back. Yeah. What her original title was, but they didn't. Uh, okay, so. I think Lillian is coming in with questions now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there. How are you? Hi, hi. hi. Good to see both of you, and you too. thank you for being here. Uh, I, we have uh, three questions. Uh, and then I have some for you as well. This is a question from uh, Mary Lou, uh, Marie Lou, uh, and she's asking, uh, has Milford appeared in any science fiction literature? And how does it feel for a science fiction writer to be living in these times that seem like a science fiction novel? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> well, um, there is one science fiction story by Thomas Ditch right. called The Squirrel Cage that takes place in the anchorage, the old anchorage. It's a, it's a near, it's a very, um, in fact, it's, 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 it's more an experimental short story. Um, I'm a character. Uh, <laughs> And Jane Salas is a character, uh, and Tom himself is a character. Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. That's that's. Yeah. The, so this the, this one also has the master of the Milford altarpiece. Yeah. Which is all. And, well, it's not. I'm sorry. It, in really. fact, it's it is the master. I'm the, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I'm thinking yes. about is is the master of the Milford okay, altarpiece, right. piece, not the Squirrel Cage, which is another very good story. Uh, I may I'm confusing mm. the two stories. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, and. Um, and it was a yeah, that, yeah. So that's one. Uh, what does it feel today? It feels just like right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'm you. Sitting okay. here, I'm I'm sitting here looking at my looking at my face mask hanging over the uh, this little light. Mm -hmm. so if I leave the house, I've got my face mask already. <laughs> I, I can tell you another one. Kate Wilhelm told me she set Somerset Dreams specifically in Milford. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Old timer, old timers should be able to read read that story, and recognize specific characters that she was modeling uh -huh. some of her characters on." But those are the uh -huh. only ones that I know of specifically. I'm surprised Avram right. Davidson didn't say anything in Milford, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did but he, I, I, don't, I don't. How long did he? I knew I I met Avram only once when I was in San, mm -hmm. living in San Francisco, uh, and I was. Yeah. Working away, and that's the only time in my life I've ever had a room of my own to do work in. Um, and I, uh, um, I was working away, and the doorbell rang, uh, and I went downstairs and I opened the door. This strange man was standing, <laughs> uh, and he said, "Are you Samuel Delaney?" And I said, uh, "Yeah." And he said, "I'm Avram Davidson." I said, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Yeah." Oh, well, I said, "Would you like to come in?" And he said, "No." But I have some advice. <laughs> and I said, what is that? He said, if you ever have a problem, get drunk. That's <laughs> any problem. And then he turned around yeah. and walked away. <laughs> well, I have another question for you uh, from mm -hmm. Marilyn Rosenthal. Uh, she's asking, can you elaborate on the connection between the Virginia Kid House Arrowhead in Milford and the current Virginia Kid Literary Agency today. Well, I mean, Virginia started that agency. That, that was Virginia's agency, and she she ran the agency from her house. Uh, and, and various and sundry people. I know Catherine Kramer worked for it there for a while, um, and I think it's still going on today, as I gather. Yes. Although Virginia died, what is it, eighty seven or? Uh, no, no, no. Well, well past it. Ninety-seven. At the, at the Ninety-seven. Early. Okay, I, I didn't. I'm, I, not, I'm not sure. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. but it, <laughs> probably even later than that. Um, you know, Virginia was really a, a top-notch agent. She was representing Ursula Le Guin and McCaffrey, yes. uh, Alan yeah. Dean Foster, and as I recall, she was grooming a guy named Jim Allen, who was local. I think. He, he said he remembered being like 10 years old and being in her office. And he was, I, my impression was that he was being groomed to take over the agency from Virginia. And then he got, I think a blood disease and died very young. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and fortunately Vaughn Hansen and Chris Cohen and a couple others, you know, it picked up the ball and have kept the agency running. So it's the agency's yeah. operated continuously for Six, yeah, 60 yeah. Virgin, years Virginia, Virginia was Virginia's health was not in the, the best of, of, of was right. not the best, um, and she was also, um, you know, these are some people find this embarrassing, and I don't know why one should. She, she also suffered uh, from a medical condition, I'm sure, for, with pathological obesity, so that she had mm -hmm. to run the agency from her bed. Uh, right. Uh, she, you know, and she was a smart and wonderful and kind and generous woman. Um, yes. I, I just was, I, I was very fond of her. Uh, but, uh, so, and, but this, you know, um, so eventually she, I, I, you know, that's what she did and what it was, she was, I don't think she was able to 
move around. I think the last time I saw her outside of Milford, I think once she came to a Nebula Award, um, mm -hmm. but in 68 or 69. But yeah. after that, I don't think I ever saw uh, Virginia any place else other than in Milford when I went down for whatever reason. Right. The, the only time I met her in person was when I came out to Milford in 1994 for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she arranged to have put us put up a lunch for me and my wife uh, out on the porch there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the kind of thing she would do. She's, yes. Yeah. As I said, and I slept at the, I slept in the Arrowhead a mm -hmm. couple of times for when I was staying, when I was visiting Milford. And she was very generous, you know. Um, to, you, know, yep. you know, sure, come in, you know, and, uh, it was just a nice, a, a nice, very kind person. Good and smart, as the devil. <laughs> it, it looks like the questions are piling up, so maybe we should. Okay, what? Uh, I have a question for you myself. Uh, basically, how has uh, science fiction as a genre changed since the original? Uh, Milford Conference, both positively and negatively. Wow, <laughs> that, that's that's a, that's yeah. an encyclopedia. That's not an article. That's an encyclopedia. Um, for one thing, the magazines don't play the same kind of role. That's one of the things. There are the publish uh, book publishers are have are entirely different. I mean, but when I was when I was first came into the field. There were something like 56 or 57 um, independent book yeah. publishers in New York, you know, in, in competition. Um, right. There were these huge places like Doubleday, uh, mm -hmm. which was an entire building on just above on Park Avenue. Um, you know, now it's, now that building doesn't have anything to do with publishing. It's a bank. Yeah. Uh, um, the uh, um, that Phantom Books, which was at 666 Fifth Avenue, was like an entire floor of that building. There, you know, now it's a desk somewhere, <laughs> random house, uh, and uh, you know, so there's there's a whole lot of uh, changes, and so, you know, there are only what, you know, and all the public, all the random houses now owned by Reuters and et cetera, et cetera, and it's uh, and there were how many? What are there are are, are there are there five? actual different publishers in new york I oh don't yeah know. yeah the, uh, the, you know there's still the, the, what they call the big five the big you know, five like hachette, yeah hachette penguin random house mcmillan um harper collins yes and right. uh and, and simon and schuster yeah but that's and not, all of them, all of them have science fiction lines yeah but that yeah but there was a, but that's not that's not that's not 57. no no yeah. but there so many indie publishers, the whole scene yeah. has changed so much. Right. Uh, one of the things that struck me in terms of the change, <laughs> Tom Dish predicted several times that science fiction would die out. I think first he said by the year 2000, then he said, well, maybe it'll keep going for a little while after that. And, you know, that was Tom and it was kind of, you know, intellectually easy to say, oh, science fiction is doomed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in so much has changed in that science fiction has gotten so widespread and so successful in the last 60 years. Right. It's yes. a completely different beast now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that, that is, that, that is indeed, that is indeed true. And, you know, and, and the, 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 the interchange between film and written science fiction yes. is an entirely different way from the way that it worked at one time. There was yes. very little, um, Crossover one to the other. Now there's right. now there's now there's a lot of crossover. Okay, uh, I have another question for you. If you went back and looked at the Futurians who came to Milford, right. Which, right? which of those authors would you say accurately describe the world uh, of today? The Futurian office. I, I, which ones were Futurians? I, I mean, I know that Judy and Merrill and Jim right. and, and Asimov. Cyril Cornbluth. And Cyril Cornbluth, which, who was possibly the one of the most more talent, most talented. 
and and poll. But there was the, the big the big split then yeah. was between you know the Stalin. They were all on the left. It was between yeah. the Stalinists and the Trotskyites, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and, uh, and um, I you know I don't know. I I, I, I it just describe the future. I am reading right now. In fact, I have. Uh, where the heck is it? Uh, oh, uh, it's yes. Here we go. Uh, huh. I'm trying to <laughs> out to the left. And, there we go. Okay, this has a this has a a, a wonderful story written in the 30s when Weinbaum was still alive um, mm -hmm. called The Revolution of the 50s, it was originally called, yeah. and then they republished it again, they called it The Revolution of the 60s, <laughs> and it's a fascist takeover in the United uh -huh. States. Um, and, you know, the, and, it, and it talks about this fascist president of the United States dismantling the FBI. Does that sound... Uh -huh. <laughs> to the, you know, uh, and and other things as well, and and the, not only that, this fascist president was once an actor, uh, <laughs> and the fact that he was an actor was sort of important in his, you know, and, and you know, um, and then there are other things that have bear no relation to the current situation at all. But I have, I'm, and, but I'm only about I, those two jumped out at me because I'm only about. You know, a third of the way through the story, and we'll probably right. try to finish it once we're finished. Because I'm kind of, I'm curious what Mr. Weinbaum, who was a very good writer, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, at that time, has to say about uh, our current situation today. Uh, yeah, I don't think a lot of the Futurians were really trying to predict the future. No, 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 in, no. in air quotes, they were more interested in using science fiction. To get at what we might call deeper truths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have very much time time left. We have about a minute. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> what? Uh, a, a very general question uh, for Ch for Chip. Uh, what book uh, have you read, or that you would re -read, rewrite more than it or re -read, uh, I'm sorry. Which books have you read that you reread often? Oh, okay. Well, probably not. I just reread The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, a poem in seven parts, uh, the, over the last two days, and it's great. Uh, still good. So you got, you got that albatross off your neck then. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it sank yeah. into the sea. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so... Uh, you know, I, I I don't read much science fiction uh, anymore. I, I that, that's true. I, and I don't read. In fact, I don't do too much reading at all anymore, uh, which is which I think is just my aging brain. Um, uh, you know, I've got uh, I have I have sh some short term memory problems, and I'm just they've just put me on Adderall uh, to see how that's going to work out. Um, and you know, and I'm 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 waiting for my first week before I make a judgment on how this stuff uh -huh. affects me. Uh, so we will we will see. But that's you know that's there you go. I don't um I don't know. Um, as I said, I'm re I, I'm rereading this one short story, um, and uh, I'm more interested in short stories now because I don't have the attention to go through novels. Mm. But I still read I still read um, essays and things like that. Uh -huh. I have been, uh, I'm looking through the, the questions. Um, I think we have 15 more minutes. We do have 15 more minutes. I don't know why yes. I thought we were done. Uh, while you're writing a science fiction novel, uh, do you have much, do you have to do much research? About uh, depending on the book. I I have I have done some. Usually, what happens? I, I've always been somebody who enjoys reading uh, popular science and what have you, and sometimes some pretty you know at, at various times some pretty um, uh, 
uh, some pretty technological science too, but I read a lot of this stuff and eventually it all comes together in a story. And then if I have there something that I have to, if it's going to be a, a, sci a story that actually involves the science, I might, you know, call somebody up and, or say, you know, because you make a lot of, you make friends in the sciences if you're a science fiction writer. There used to be a guy who's dead now, of course, named Stu Steve Coleman, who taught mm -hmm. physics. Sydney, Co Sydney Coleman. Sydney, Sid Sydney Coleman, whom yeah. I occasionally call up. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, an, there was an embryologist in England at the University of, what was it, Sussex? I'm, I don't, I think it was Sussex whom I would occasionally uh, check out this, that, or the other. Um, and, you know, and that to, just to get a, make sure that one thing or the other was correct. But I rarely did I do research for a, you know, do specific research for a story. Um, usually the, the scientific ideas came together and made the story, uh, which is one of the things that, um, that's the way science fiction tended to work for me. Okay, we have a question from somebody called uh, named Ben, and he's uh, asking you if you have any memories or anecdotes about F I L K in Milford. About filking. Filking? Uh, I never. I um, other than a guy named uh, what is it? Uh, other than a fan named Lonely Pierre, whom I used to see at Fil one, Filthy uh, Pierre. Filthy, Filthy Pierre. Pierre. Yeah, yeah, wandering around with a guitar at various science fiction conventions, I know nothing about Filky. Uh, I don't think I've ever sat and listened to a Filk song from one end to the other in my life, and if I do did, I don't remember it. Uh, I myself used to like folk music a lot, uh, and uh, I used to uh, I used to actually sing it myself and and um, wander around the village with my guitar and play at various. It's been open for Bob Dylan. <laughs> One, <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, that was a long that was a long time ago. And I actually had a, for a while I was going to give up music and be a a, a, a guitarist for a, a group called Heavenly Breakfast. And I they, eventually I um, it didn't work out. Uh, and um, I wrote a book, a short book about them that a lot of people seem to like. Uh, called Heavenly Breakfast after the commune and the group, but that's about you know that's that's um, that's about as close as I got to that. So as filking, you know, I, I was too much. I was I I love uh, um, folk music much too much perhaps to get into the sort of parody pastiche aspect of filking. Yeah, I I don't think many of the Milford attendees were regularly part of the filking community. I know Damon yeah. and Kate weren't weren't part of that, and I don't think Judy right. or Jim Bliss yeah. were. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have another question, and it comes from Christine, and mm -hmm. she wants uh, to know for anyone new in the genre, new to the genre, what books or stories mm. do they start with? Well, I think every literate person ought to read the science fiction of Theodore Sturgeon. I've mm -hmm. that's. I still I think he's one of the great great short story writers of the of the middle of the last century, uh, and I think he's uh, and they uh, um, a, a bunch of us worked very hard to make sure that his work his short story work got got uh, saved in a thirteen volume set, which is uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it's over there wherever there is. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, and I, I think his work stands up remarkably well. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm still a fan of, of, you know, the, of Bester's, the stars, my destination yeah. and the demolishment. Um, <laughs> uh, so those, those, I, those, those, are, I, those are good. Those, those are good ones. I, I would start a new, a new re reader with a short story collection. One of the anthologies, like the science fiction hall of fame or, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I did one of the very best from fantasy and science fiction. It's, I don't think it's still in print, but it seems to me that short, uh, one of the good anthologies of short stories is a good entry point. Right. Um, more so than, to, than any one novel. Yeah. There, there was, there was a tradition for a long while of, of every year there would be a best of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Does right. that, that doesn't happen anymore. Not a, not for a long time now. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the market's uh, changed too much. 
Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have a question from John Beardman. He's asking, do you consider Dostoevsky a surrealist or a pure surrealist, a pre-surrealist? I would say he's a, I think what I'd say he's sort of a, I'd say he's sort of a, uh, a poetic think, a poetic realist. Um, not, although his style apparently is not terribly poetic. He's closer to, people who speak Russian tell me he's closer to Dreiser. Uh, he's, he's like a Dreiser with a mystical streak uh, than he is, whereas Tolstoy is, is the guy who writes the fine Russian. Uh, and Dostoevsky is the, is the guy who writes the kind of mumbling Russian, but has, but has pretty weird ideas about salvation and all those, and all those okay. things. Uh, so I wouldn't think I wouldn't think of Dostoevsky in any kind of relation to science fiction at all. Okay. You don't think he was the 19th century Philip K. Dick? <laughs> Possibly. I don't know. I find Dick's work. I always have found Dick's work pretty difficult to get down. Mm -hmm. I edited one of his novels, and the one I edited, which was a non-science fiction novel, I think it was called Mary and the Giant. I was really yep. impressed why when I had to read it slowly uh, and pay mm -hmm. attention to it uh, but that but so I will give him that um, but that's about as far as I can go okay we have a question from uh, Ruby Lynn Willis and she's asking uh, is the current condition condition of the world inspiring you to write and if so what are you up to um, um. I don't know. I don't, um, I've written a few short stories that I'm trying to get together sort of into a, a last collection or what have you. I think it will probably be my last fiction collection. Uh, and I don't write very many short stories. I'm mostly a, I mostly have been a novelist. Uh, so that's, there you go. Uh, that's about the best I can say. Uh, do you do, do you still do fiction, Gordon? Uh, not that I'll admit to, no. Oh, okay, <laughs> they're, all right. They're, they're, they're postal reports that might, some people might consider fiction, but I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, because well, I, I, Gordon and I originally met at a Clarion conference. Right, in 1987. Right, many years ago. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question for you, Chip. Uh, if you were uh, writing Dahlgren today, would anything be different? No. <laughs> No, exactly the same. <laughs> that was short and sweet. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the book. Okay. And uh, let's see, do we have... Is there anything you uh, wish you had written but never had the chance to? For every book I have written, there are about 25 that I have not written. Some of them have <laughs> got, you know, 20 pages done on. But uh, um, I, it's very funny because people are always saying, well, you're so prolific. I'm not prolific. I, I, all I think of when I think of my bibliography, I think of the, the, the many, many never written titles, you know, yeah. that never got, never got. So I think of myself as a very lazy, very, you know, non-prolific writer. Um, you know, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm stuck with by being me. <laughs> uh, so uh, there were lots of things that I would have liked to have written. There's, there are lots of things that I have tried to go back and write again and again and again, and I've ne they've never worked. Uh, uh, and so, you know, so I just sometimes, eventually you just give up. You realize that one's not going to, you know. There, you know, there you, you, you can go to web, my website and scroll through the thing called books. And I'm very lucky that so many of my books still are in print. Uh, but, um, well, you know, and so there you go. Well, sometimes there are uh, uh, fame and talent just don't go together. Uh, what authors... Uh, do you think deserve or deserved far more attention than they've actually gotten? As I've said them, I've given their names already. Sturgeon, uh, certainly one. Uh, 
Um, and um, uh, yeah, and and Bester, you know, I don't think I think outside of the realms of science fiction, not too many people know know his work. He didn't write that much, and he didn't write that much that at the high, you know, at, of his best things. And there are not uh, there are two great novels, uh, and, and there's a bunch of novels later on that yeah, they don't quite they don't quite work. Uh, I don't think, but they're still interesting. Um, there's a nonfiction science. There's a nonfiction. There's a non-science fiction book that Gordon referred to earlier uh, that was published under several titles. The original title was Who He, and then it was called The Rat Race. Uh, and wasn't it? Didn't it have one other title? I don't think so. I don't think so but it I'm might have. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and it's all about live television. Uh, the days of live television, the kinds of things that could only happen before they made a point of of, of putting everything on videotape. Um, uh, and there's a there's a, 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 a horrifically funny scene that opens it with a murder being committed on a live television show, and a, a, and and the show what the audience sees is a a, a complicated dance number completely going to pieces, but. <laughs> going to pieces because just outside of the frame somebody a corpse is hanging yeah. is falling down and is dangling over the stage and everybody knows they're dancing under uh <laughs> somebody who is and you know and there were all sorts of little things like that where sort of he plays with what the audience sees versus versus what's the reality of things is it's very very a very clever uh, and he knew what live television was about I saw him in an interview, you know, not live, that where he named the guy who um, whose show it was the book was modeled on, and I'm blanking on his name right now, but I know he was the voice of Tigger the Tiger on Winnie the Pooh. It'll come in a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have another question for you. Uh, Robert Levin uh, has a, is asking: Is any book that has anticipated today's dystopian times well they, they the the thing with dystopias and that you know it's like a scattershot thing if you make 25 predictions you know and you take you know you fire a shotgun at a barn one or two of them is going to hit the wall yeah. you know uh so you're going to get it you know so you're going to you know hit something um and a lot of them a, lo a lot of them a lot of them have as i i pointed i pointed about at this Weinbaum story that I did pick up and start just before the show, uh, the revolution, the, the revolution of the '60s, it was called, uh, is called today. Although it was originally published under the title "Revolution of the '50s," and then it's now being republished. Get this, and you probably, if you've been following the news, you'll know why. It's now called "The President's Sister." <laughs> The President's Sister. Not you know, I, I edited an anthology a few years ago called Welcome to Dystopia, and we had 45 stories of all dystopian visions. Mm -hmm. None of them nailed things directly, you know, even yeah. three years later. So much of it is not really trying to predict what will happen. Some of it's trying to prevent what the worst things that might right. come to pass. Uh, but I think some of it is just expressing a, you know, a point of view of how bad things are right now by showing them through a, you know, a scenario of what happens if they get worse, a sort of if this goes on extrapolation. Yeah. So I think a, lo a lot of dystopian fiction is like that. I, I was really pleased. I, I don't meet, didn't see many reviews for the book, but one of them was from someone who reads a lot of YA fiction and said, you know, I love dystopian fiction, but this book was not dystopian fiction. This was all about stuff that might actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, I have one, one more question before we uh, sort of wrap things up a little bit. And it's from Will Reeve. Do you plan on coming back to our head? Uh, uh, <clears throat> alas, I don't. I probably, you know, who, you know, what man hath the oracle of his Bones or what have said Thomas Brown, uh, but I don't know. I don't. I I I 
at 78 and you know off in a, in a suburb of Philadelphia I doubt that I'm probably going to get back to the arrowhead uh, at all if I do it'd be wonderful I mean it'd be nice it would be it'd be nice to see it again uh, it'd be lovely to see you here pardon me it would be lovely to see you here I, I would like you know I would like to but but you know I I, I don't drive uh, and I some I would have to you know um, somebody there would have to be a reason to come and uh, so I don't and as I said I was I'm not one of the I'm not one of the kid uh, clients a uh, kid agency's clients so there's not too much chance of it uh, if it happened I wouldn't be unhappy I have very pleasant memories of Milford but it's been a long time it's been I think at this point it's fair to say that it's been 40 years at least since I've been in Milford well, we're we're just about ready to move on and and uh, end this session. But before I end it, I'd like to thank you, Gordon, for coming back to the festival again this year. We certainly appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll get my, to see you here in my Milford. pleasure. Yes, exactly. it was it was fun to get a chance to reminisce about uh, you know about, about the old times. Uh, yeah, I think there's more chance of Gordon. Getting back to to, to the well, I hope so. We hope so. so too. And oh. Chip, I'd like to thank you as well for agreeing to be part of this festival. My my it's pleasure. Great, great. Lots of fun. You've all been very kind. And I'm sure our audience, as as I do, uh, have found this to be a a, a, a very pleasurable and more a memorable occasion. Uh, your memories are, are uh, fun to listen to, and I'm sure we uh, all enjoyed it. And Thank you. the importance of, of science fiction and the influence of the Milford uh, experience uh, mm -hmm. from the 50s uh, is something that I think everybody should know about and, and, and cherish. And thank, thank you for you. being here again. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, well, thank oh, you very much, Lillian. Lillian. Okay, and thanks, Gordon. Thank, thank you both. Experience uh, from the 50s uh, is something that I think everybody should know about and, and, and cherish. And thank you for being here again. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, well, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you both. And thank you both. Thank you, Chip and Gordon, for that fascinating conversation. And the amazing, the amazing history of Milford. Um, I think that for the people that live in Milford now, uh, have no idea what the rich history was of the science fiction in Milford. Uh, I hope everybody in Milford was watching today because really that was an amazing piece of history and how it all started here in Milford. And basically that was the uh, impetus for our Milford Readers and Writers Festival was the science fiction connection. When um, people got together and talked about that, that was, what was the kind of birth of our current Milford Readers and Writers Festival, and which is why we always include science fiction in the festival. So thank you again for coming and Chip for coming virtually. If you can't make it here in person, we'd love to see you anytime. And Lillian for the questions and our questioners from home. So remember, we have one more conversation. Our last one is this evening at 7.30 p.m. We have the young author, George M. Johnson at 7.30, right here on your screen, discussing their autobiography of growing up black and gay in New Jersey. It's a very touching memoir uh, aimed at uh, a young audience. It's a youth um, audience and some very good insights for people that might be struggling with some of the things he struggled with. And also we would appreciate your tax deductible donation in any amount to keep the festival alive and so we're ready to present to you again in person next year you can contribute on our website at milfordreadersandwriters.com 
by clicking on the donate button. And also mark your calendars and reserve the weekend of September 17, 18, and 19, 2021 for next year's festival. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you this evening.